to meet you. Very, very nice to meet you. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. The, uh, everything's open. Sort yeah. of, I guess. Everything's back to normal. I don't know. Well, it's, you know, kind of, sort of. We'll see what happens. We'll <laughs> see. We'll see. How are you doing? I'm just fine. You know, how is how exciting is it? Your first feature, it just dropped yesterday on digital and DVD. It's a little crazy. You work for so long. This one, you know, I mean, this took about two years. I know a lot of other filmmakers go through a lot longer of a process, but still it's like you work on these things kind of every day for that amount of time, and then one day it's just out in the world, and you don't know what to do with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Have you gotten any feedback yet? Yeah, yeah, there's been, you know, there's been some, 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 it's not for everybody, but we've gotten a lot of good reviews, a lot of, you know, folks that have written about it in engaging ways who are asking questions about it and kind of like the, the oddness of the film and the oddness of the tone. I've been noticing that word a lot, which is, you, you know, could be negative, but I in the reviews I've read, it seemed like they were um, intrigued by it and, and engaged in the storytelling. So it's been exciting to and frightening to see how people react. <laughs> <laughs> I like that word, frightening. It's frightening. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of frightening. But it's like, you know, yeah, you, you just have a stomach ache and you're like, wait a second, like, why do you put yourself through this? But it's like, because movies are the best. And, you know, you... You want to tell stories and you want to put something out there that means something to you. And, it, you know, it's just getting critiqued on it can always be a little painful. But um, it's, it's great to have other interpretations and um, sort of ideas behind what the movie is. So it's been fun. Well, and that's one of the things. Odd is a good word for the ambient <laughs> nature of it. But odd is exactly what you need with this film with the way you're telling this story you this would not work or be as effective uh if this if this was you know sunny beaver cleaver neighborhood <laughs> i i think you're right i mean you know a big challenge with this movie was trying to write and make a movie about characters that don't know how to communicate to one another and are you know in their head most of the film so it's like how do you do that and not make this movie super boring and confusing um and you know i know we tried to to leave the film a bit up to interpretation and tried to keep a lot of mystery in it in in hopes that it didn't you know get in the way of you and actually enjoying the film um but yeah we really you know the film focuses a lot on mental illness and trying to figure out how to navigate through that. And when you're going through it, it isn't clear. It isn't, you know, uh, a beautiful arc of understanding what you're going through. It's kind of muddy and it's stressful and it can be confusing and you don't quite know what to do with yourself. So we tried to put the feeling of anxiety and depression and, you know, just mental illness issues that a lot of people deal with today um, and have for a long time. Uh, we tried to put that into this film in how we edited, how we shot, how the performances were laid out. Well, you know, even even going beyond that, if, if people don't pick up on any kind of mental, a mental illness aspect of it, um, the character of Charlie in particular you know, who stays to himself, you know, in that house, always has ear earphones in. I think a lot of people after the past 15 months with lockdowns, I really think that they can relate to that just as a survival mechanism and just getting one foot in front of the other day after day. Yeah, it can feel impossible uh, when you your eyes open and the day is in front of you and... It, it can just feel like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Um, I per I still find myself, I'll put my headphones in to listen to podcasts, to listen to music, but I'll do it even if I'm not listening to anything. It's sure. become a thing for me that is, like, comforting. Mm -hmm. Is it maybe blocking out what's happening in, around you and maybe preventing you from being in the present? 
probably, you know, but, it, you know, I think there's a balance and, um, you know, we, we need to find ways to cope with the uncertainty and the anxiety that we have. And um, I don't think there's totally a right way to do it. We kind of need to see what works for us. Um, as long as you aren't hurting anybody else and you are taking care of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, something that you do exceedingly well with this film, Matthew, from the very start that gets the whole ball rolling is sound. What Jimmy Welsh and Jacob and Justin have done with sound is impeccable. You draw us in. And you can only imagine as the story is unfolding, you can only imagine, okay, maybe, you know, Charlie is, has the earphones in to block out all of this ambient sound. We hear the wasps very clearly. We've got the ringing of the telephone, the incessant ringing of the telephone that Charlie is, you know, either ignoring or is deaf to. So it makes you wonder how loud he has the volume up on you know his earphones but by the same but you're giving us that volume so it's kind of drowning things out and puts you into charlie's headspace of i want to drown all of this out it's so much it's a cacophony uh, it's so much i need to drown it out but yeah. the sound design and the mix with the birds the wasps the phones the, the metal screen door, that has one of the most distinctive sounds in the world. <laughs> and you've got that so perfectly nailed here. And this is what you greet us with. And then you keep that throughout the film and you build upon it with doorknobs, with the car, with the sound of, the sh of a spade hitting the dirt. You just, you keep us in that sonic, that sonic soundscape. And it's incredible. And then we're watching everything else happening. We really become an observational Charlie of seeing what's happening and trying to drown it out. And I love it. I love how you lead us in. That's so sweet. That's so nice of you. I mean, yeah, that was something, the sound was something especially we worked really hard on and wanted to be, you know, a character in the story as, you know, that's a little pretentious. Uh, but, you know, we knew that the film wasn't going to have a giant score. We knew there wasn't a ton of dialogue overall in the movie. So we wanted the sound design to really, yeah, put the audience not necessarily in Charlie's shoes, but sort of to, to, as you said, observe as he is just unable to open himself up and allow anything in. You know, uh, there are people around him throughout his life that, like, want to help him and are calling him and reaching out. And he, with the headphones, with the way that he kind of can't stop himself from working, he's just doing whatever he can to block out anything other than what is happening inside of his head so you know in, in terms of kind of influences um punch shrunk love by paul thomas anderson that movie with adam sandler the sound design is so anxiety inducing and stressful and rhythmic and that, that was a film that we looked at as like man they do a really good job of using sound to just create a really powerful emotion um, in the audience as well as, you know, basically creating the sound of how this character is feeling. And we, we really wanted to use natural noises that, you know, you would hear if you're inside the house, whether it's the water dripping or the coffee bubbling or the door or the phone. You know, it's all these things that um, you you kind of it's part of your day and you kind of need to tend to these things but if you are depressed if you are full of anxiety it can make the simplest things seem impossible you know it can feel impossible to answer a phone call even if it's coming from somebody who you care about and who cares about you so i thank you so much for for those kind kind words i will relay them to jimmy and justin um 
and Jacob, who all did, yeah, a pretty stellar job of uh, capturing and then mixing. Yeah, I mean, just the sound, the sound is impeccable in this film. But then what you also do, you go and you bring Michael Lincoln in with the cinematography and the visual tonal bandwidth the two of you um, have developed is... I am I love it because you give us that bluish gray, the much cooler look for the for the bulk of the film until we get into that third act when Charlie goes to Uncle Pete's house. And then Uncle Pete's house you've got the darker woods, um the the lantern kind of light that casts a golden glow. And then we never really see any kind of sunlight, hope, daylight until we get to the end credits and you have and you know we've got Betty and Ben driving along and the sun is shining and she's smiling for the first time and I love that visual tonal shift how okay. did you, how did you and Michael go about designing this particular tonal look for the film yeah, again, thank you so much. That's so nice of you to say, and awesome that you noticed these things. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, that was kind of the most fun. Um, it, it, when I think back to the whole process of making the movie, the week, you know, I think Michael and I only maybe had a week and a half, maybe two weeks to sit and design the movie. And a lot of the shots I, you know, had in my head and tried to um, communicate in the script, but... Michael is an incredible photographer and just like a really artistic presence and warm person. So sitting with him, going through the script, going through every scene and trying to figure out, you know, okay, we don't have a lot of time to make this movie. So how can we tell our story in as few amount of shots as possible? How mm -hmm. can we convey the feeling of the movie and the feeling that these characters are going through you know, in the way that we design our shots instead of getting traditional coverage. Um, you know, we, we rarely use wide shots. Uh, a, a big part of that is because we wanted the movie to feel like it's kind of a microscope on these people who, you know, they, you know, as we spoke about with sound, it's like they're kind of blocking everything from outside of them. So we didn't really want to show a ton happening outside of mm -hmm. them because they aren't really attuned to it. They're not aware of what's happening. So you don't really see a wide shot of the house. You don't really see much of, like, the neighborhood that they're in. Um, and, yes, yeah, with the color palette, we wanted, you know, that kind of the grays and the greens and the blues to to really show the, the solemnness that these characters are going through. Um, we warm up a lot of the colors when we go into Uncle Pete, mm -hmm. um, mainly as a way to, you know, make this place that is weird and off the beaten path and mysterious also kind of welcoming and warming because I think for Charlie, like, what his uncle is telling him he can do, like, and how he can handle this problem that he's going through, it's kind of the more comfortable, easy way out because it's a little less challenging. He doesn't need to essentially confront the things that he is ignoring. He is hiding and avoiding, which mm -hmm. is what Uncle Pete is doing. So it's enticing. It's sort of like, oh, man, if I do this, I don't really have to um, deal with some of the things that are, like, bogging me down every day. I won't hear the phone ring anymore. Like, that sounds kind of nice. I kind of want to do yep. that. Um, even though... You know, that's probably not the way that uh, Charlie should should live. Um, and then, yeah, we, we wanted to kind of crack these characters out of their shell at the end of the movie and put them in the real world, which that final shot is kind of, you know, it's a zoom out to reveal environment and blue skies. And we, you know, up the saturation there to make it look a little bit like the Wizard of Oz. Just this idea that, like, there is life outside of the darkness and you can push forward and find it you know if mm -hmm. you if, if you take the time and allow yourself to be vulnerable and ask for help yeah but there's still that black hefty bag in the back seat 
it's always there. It's all. It's always there. Yeah, but, it's like that's something I'm learning. It's like, you know, I think for so long, and I still do it. You know, now it's like constantly trying to figure things out and do the thing that's going to make everything kind of fall into place, and it doesn't work that way. Like, you you got to just all of this stuff is like a forever process of learning how to love yourself and be okay and you know that, that stuff doesn't go away i think you get better at managing the things that you struggle with um and you know yeah that's kind of the symbolism behind you know we, we've all got our baggage mm -hmm. well you know i love the visual metaphor that you have happening here it's number one you know with the light at uncle pete's cabin um you know, it also, it's the first time that Charlie has any kind of light at the end of the tunnel. So you have that beautiful metaphor happening there. But also when you look at things like, you know, the wasps, um, the doorknob stick, she can't find the key, all these little things, they're, they're more or less visual obstacles. And not just for Charlie, but also to a very large degree, Betty as well, um, which is also where Michael's framing uh, you've got some really powerful images happening with a frame in that tight alleyway between Charlie's house and Russ's house. Um, you know, you've got some really good, perfectly framed doorway shots with somebody there, but then you're, you are falling into negative space beyond that because Charlie never has lights turned on in his house. No lights are turned on. <laughs> Betty doesn't have them on in her house either. Um, but at least she's got a window with light coming through it. Um, so I find this really interesting. But you get into things, the minutia, like the screen. And early on, like the 11-minute the mark of the film, you've got that great shot where you've got Charlie in his room and he's, he's working on something. And slowly the camera starts panning. And opening up so that we don't we're not just looking at Charlie suddenly it's like a superimposition almost and then you see it's not a superimposition it's the window screen and the screen is broken so it's like that little bit of life can come in and out of it but the rest of of the world is clouded and hidden by that screen and that is so visually telling, so early in the film. I just love that. <laughs> that. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was Michael did a really beautiful job figuring out how to how to get that shot to work. We were excited about it, and yeah, I think you know those little flashes of light that try to make their way into into the house. It's like Charlie's reaction to it. You know, he's he's already barely listening to the character who is talking to him behind him, but this sucks all of his his attention directly to it. And his the first thing he does is, you know, figure out a way to replace the screen so those flashes aren't there and that light is not coming through. Um, he's you know, as as we spoke about, he's forever just trying to keep any life that is trying to come close to him and do some good to for him he's trying to find a way to push it away yeah you know it's you know visually sonically it this is so well constructed matthew you really it, the effort you put in and the thoughtfulness you put in really comes through because that's what really fuels this story you know and then we, we got to look at the characters and i got to say it's almost like Ben is a MacGuffin in this film. Um, number one, the fact the only time you see him is in his little ranger uniform with a hat on. It makes you wonder, okay, he's never at work. <coughs> you know, it's, he's always showing up with coffee. Um, but he's never at work. No matter what time of the day or night, he's not at work. But he's in this little ranger uniform with his little ranger hat. And you're wondering the whole time, it's like, who the heck is this guy? Um, <clears throat> you know, is he a figment of somebody's imagination? <laughs> um, but for the fact that, yeah, he's with Betty, but Betty is, she is, has the look 
and the, the mental grasp of a five-year-old for most of the film. It's yeah, like ben, she's ben, stuck. Ryan, Ryan Katner plays Benjamin, um, and he's, he's a, an, a pretty incredible guy. He's a musician um, and plays with this group Man Man. And he's kind of, he's a songwriter and front man. And his, you see him on stage and he is like this incredibly um, performative figure. And, and the shows are just insane and it's really fun. And I, I thought it'd be funny to put him in a film where nobody is giving him anything. <laughs> you know, the scenes with Charlie, the scenes with Betty, he is trying so hard to just pull something from them to engage, to, to work with. And, and they just don't have the tools developed to, to do so. Um, and yeah, it's like the, the Ranger outfit. That was, that was actually a, a idea that Ryan presented. Um, I think, you know, totally one show that we all really love is Twin Peaks mm -hmm. um, and the weirdness of that. So I know that, that show influenced a bit of like the humor we were trying to uh, provide here. It's not, you know, roll on the floor, you know, crack up type of humor, but we tried to insert little things that um, might make you chuckle. And the idea that, yeah, this park ranger is here trying to put out these the fires within this family, yet he can't even, you know, handle a wasp nest. And you, you don't quite know if he actually has a job or if he's wearing a Halloween <laughs> costume. Um, we wanted, you know, for for the audience to kind of feel for this guy. And as annoying as it can be when someone's kind of nagging at you, it's like, I think it's coming from a good place. And he, he loves his fiance, he loves Charlie. He's doing what he can to kind of bring them together, um, but it's just, it's it's a muddy journey to get there. Yeah, and I have to say, kudos to paying attention to putting, like, the little the little calamine lotion dots on, on wasp <laughs> things on it, the right arm. I, I did, that was great. That was a great... Yeah, M Michelle Elizabeth, who did the um, costuming, that was her... Her expertise, she she made that lotion uh, look great. Yeah, we, it, we, again, it's like another little attempt at humor, like to, to sh kind of show it throughout the rest of the movie. You see it kind of flaking off of his skin, and um, you know he might not be a great park ranger, but you know at least he knows to put calamine lotion on. Yeah, you know, or who knows? Maybe Betty put it on, but for so much <laughs> of the film, Betty Most likely. Yeah. But you know, well, she probably handed him the bottle and then left the room. Uh, quite possibly, because she is so empty. Yeah. She is so empty. She is a blank slate. And the fact that she is shot and her makeup is done so that her face, it's almost, it's just this side of kabuki white. <laughs> um, so she is, you know, you're not quite sure, you know, what her, what her deal is until she gets that call from her mother and she starts mm -hmm. and she goes to her mother's house and then starts looking and digging and then slowly life starts come returning to her and yeah. you even you even express that with layers in her clothing too yeah um jesse rabideau who plays betty she we met her kind of late in the process as we were trying to find our character and she, when I sat and we just spoke about this script, she just very much connected to it and um, I think, you know, could relate to the idea of tension within a family. You know, every family has tension. Um, a lot of the time it's not dealt with and I, I think that's something that she kind of could connect with and it's she had a hard job to, you know, be, yeah, this kind of, unable to communicate, unable to really express much emotion type of character. Um, and, you know, you use the word empty, and I think that was a big, big thing when trying to crack this character. It's like, on paper, she's doing everything she's supposed to. She's like, she's living in her own place. She's not still living at her parents' old house. She is uh, engaged to get married. There's a reveal at the end that is another thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, these she's sort of doing everything you're supposed to do as, like, an adult. 
that is expected of you, yet she still feels completely helpless and unable to enjoy what's happening. And that is something that, you know, uh, depression can do. It's like even if everything around you looks like it's, it's the way it's supposed to be, you're just like, I still feel empty. I still feel like this isn't right. Like, I don't... I don't know what's wrong with me because I'm not enjoying this when other people are. And I think Jesse yeah, did. She had a, a really tough job um, it, to to try to convey that, but I, I think she did excellent. And mm-hmm. um, I'm excited to see what other work she does because it's funny you meet her and she's like an incredibly bubbly, funny person. Um, so for her to kind of be the reverse of that was um, I'm sure it was a challenge <laughs> for her but I'm, I'm very thankful that she committed to it you know the one and I I have to say I absolutely I just busted a gut laughing um to see Charlie putting on a suit putting putting a coffin on top of the car strapping it down and driving around with a coffin on top of the car under a blue moving blanket that just <laughs> You know, as a kid, you always wonder about things like that. You know, how come somebody just doesn't tie the box on top of the car and drive it where they're going to drive it? Well, here we have somebody actually doing that. And when we actually see the coffin, was it my imagination or is the top of it a door? And then it has the padlocks around it. It looked like a door. That's really interesting. Yeah, it definitely, like, it definitely, that's super interesting. Yeah, as you mentioned, like, doorknobs and keys and doors are, you know, they play a part in the story. Um, I wish I could take credit for the fact that it looks like a door, but now that you say that, uh, I'm going to stick to it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is, really. Right? It's sort of like, this is now, he is, you know, he is downsizing um, mm-hmm. the, the house that he that he will be living in. So that's really interesting. Um the, the casket on the roof, that was actually kind of what started this whole story. Um, <laughs> that was the first image that came to mind. When I, I was talking with Adam Helferty, who plays Charlie, and Ryan Katner, who plays Benjamin, and the image of a guy putting a casket on his roof and driving off into the distance, sort of like, you know, uh, Christmas vacation, when they've got the giant Christmas tree on yeah. the and it looks ridiculous. We were like, yeah, that's weird. Like, what is going on with that guy? Um, and I think the, the initial idea maybe was more of a comedic thing, um, whereas the movie takes a bit of a darker tone. But I, I, you know, I think it's still it's still kind of ridiculous what he's doing. So I, I hope people can get a bit of a kick out of it. I think it, I think it's great fun, and the fact that that's Charlie awesome. has put on. You know, and you have to assume this is the wedding suit that they dropped off that he's supposed to wear to the wedding. But he puts on a suit and tie to drive this casket around. And, you know, it's there is a solemnity to it from his from his viewpoint. But at the same time, to an outsider, it's funny as can be. Yeah. Like, are you going to a wedding? Are you going to a funeral? You're... Your suit sort of looks like Pee Wee Herman. Like, what's yeah. going on here? <laughs> but yeah, we were trying to kind of yeah mess with all those things, and and um, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. But you know, and that that's one of the keys, though, because when you're looking at mental mental health issues, um, when you're looking at depression, you know, it's those moments of laughter. Mm-hmm. You know, the absurd things in life that are going to help bring you out of out of a funk or out of a depressive state. When you can see the humor in something, when that starts returning, so, uh, you know, that I think is really important for the audience to see that so that we're laughing and we're seeing the humor that hopefully the cat, you know, the characters will see. For sure, yeah. Even, yeah, even the slightest little smirk or smile, yeah. you know, can 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 help, you know, when things are dreary and feeling impossible. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, Ben showing up with coffee all the time does not help in his hat. That... <laughs> when, when the producers first looked at the script, they were like, man, there's a lot of coffee in this movie. Like, we, we got to make sure that we got plenty of this to go around. That is just, for me, I don't know, there's little things in movies that just 
just feel very movie-like to me. Yeah. Going, going to diners and drinking coffee is one of those things, and that's something that, you know, every I think every filmmaker has a scene of that. Um, so we needed to figure out, like, we need a good diner scene. We need to have coffee. David Lynch also, you know, he, he loves his coffee and his pies and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, me personally, coffee is, you know, what, uh, it, it helps the day, uh, move forward. So we, we knew that we had to put as much coffee in, in the film as possible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how did you, I, I'm really enamored with the shrouded figure that you have created. Um, the darkness. How did you come up with that look? It's really interesting. It's like a 10-foot tall person or entity in this black, heavy, full but head-to-toe shroud. And it is fascinating to see when it appears. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, that, that was, you know, we, we talked about, you know, what's the extreme version of this, you know, doing something that's like really over the top and out of this world and, it, it never felt right, you know, it felt like we knew we were, you know, tr- kind of riding a line because this movie is, you know, it's sort of a drama first and then it happens to have horror um, kind of sprinkled in. So we didn't want to totally take people out of the movie. Um, but, you know, I think the, it, it, the face of the creature isn't revealed much, but... When we were designing it, we really wanted it to look like the worst version of Charlie as possible. Like it is as big and as ominous as it is. It like it still has a human quality to it, mm-hmm. um, and you know it's keeping itself in the darkness very much like Charlie is. And we, you know, it really is a manifestation of. A lot of, of things, you know, uh, it, it's at the end of the day, it's really all of the voices in your head that are telling you that you aren't good enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we wanted to just create that in a visual way and invoke the idea of this kind of cloud that is following you around. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like Eeyore who, who walks around and it's just constantly <laughs> raining just on him. Um, that hunchback creature is, you know, is kind of the rain cloud and the baggage that, that comes with um, struggling with these things. Mm-hmm. And of course, that third act scene uh, in the attic between Betty, when Betty faces this shrouded figure faces this darkness that is so key and so powerful Matthew and the fat and that is where your sound design and Jimmy who also did your score where that comes in and that's that's a really interesting part of the soundscape here is the score because it's not traditional scoring the score really plays into almost a sound effect kind of nature that blends with the specific sounds of wasps and doorknobs and screens and things like that. It, I'm really curious about your discussions with Jimmy to come up with that scoring design in tandem with the sound. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, from the start, we, we didn't want to have a giant score beneath this or over it like whichever way it can sometimes go um we we really wanted to to rely on non-diegetic any music to be non-diegetic so Mm -hmm. any music within the movie is on the radio or you know or it's coming from a tv it's it's more lived in that way we felt um but we knew that we wanted to accent some of the you know more creepy moments so yeah, as you said, you know, we tried to use kind of sound effects to create more of a rhythmic um, soundscape to it. Yeah, we, we didn't totally call it a score. It was a little more of like a soundscape and sound yeah. um, kind of pattern. Yeah. Um, and, and with Jimmy, yeah, we, Jimmy is an incredible musician and a friend of mine from super from so long ago, and he he had never 
done um, a, a film before, so it was really fun to kind of let him do his thing. Um, we spoke about, you know, just kind of the droning noises and, and noises that we felt gave off this cerebral feeling and, you know, sort of sounded like what a migraine or a headache might feel like where it's, you know, we don't want to uh, totally make the audience uncomfortable necessarily, but we want to try to provide them with the feeling that Charlie is feeling and what that tension and anxiety in the head might sound like. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, a lot of kind of low droney noises. And then he also, Jimmy also used um, this device called an Evo that yeah, I, I honestly don't totally know how it works, but he, <laughs> he, he basically, it's like a slide guitar um, that just adds these like really high pitched kind of like stinging sounds that we tried to use to accent certain edits in certain moments that made you kind of flinch a little bit. Um, it reminded me a little bit of some of the like the scary darker darker scenes of um, of uh, Willy Wonka in the mm-hmm. Chocolate Factory. Like they have like some weird like sort of high pitched noises. Yeah. That, you know, you're that are very uncomfortable to listen to. So he he brought that to the mix, and I had no idea that he wanted to do that. And kind of the moment he laid that stuff in, it was like, oh man, yeah, this really kind of heightens the, um, the the tension and the like disquieting feeling that we were trying to put out there. Yeah, it, it's a very experiential mm-hmm. kind of a, a quote unquote scoring. And it fits this so extremely well. Well, I've got to ask you the big question here, Matthew. First feature film, you had done some shorts. What was the learning curve like for you with this one? Oh, man. I mean, there's there's so much. There's so much that just like, you know, kind of practical stuff that you learn while doing this. But, like, I, I think the, the biggest thing... You know, that I took from it was kind of it was dropping the fear of failure. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I think you you very much. You know, I, I, for so long I felt like I was kind of asking permission to try to make stuff. I felt like I needed to be knighted or I needed to be told like, hey, you're ready to go and make your thing. Here's the resources. Go make it. Um, and unfortunately, that. Or fortunately, that is not how it works. You yeah. know, I, I very much learned that, like, if you are passionate about a story, if, if you want to paint, if you want to write music, whatever it is, it's like, and, and you feel that you have something to say and that that medium is the right way to say it, then then you have to kind of work through the discomfort and the fear and just go for it. Um, what I, I quickly learned that making movies is like a continual state of being more uncomfortable than you ever thought you could be. <laughs> and, and, then I, and then I think it's, it's working through that and sort of, you know, if, if you're uncomfortable and unsure of yourself, that can be a good thing because you are challenging yourself and you're pushing yourself forward and you're not staying stagnant and sort of letting things pass you by. So for me, it's really, yeah, kind of taking the, the whole experience is like, okay, I, I think I could do this again. Um, you want to get better on, with every, every element of filmmaking. Everything needs to be better. But taking the plunge of, of you know, asking people and reaching out to people to try to help you make this thing um, is something that, you know, I'm not as fearful of uh, moving forward. <laughs> well, with what you turned out with woe, you should not be fearful at all. You, I, that's you, so great of you. Thank you. You understand storytelling, and you know how to use the tools in the cinematic toolbox to tell the story. Um, job well done, Matthew. Thank you so much, Debbie. Uh, it was so nice to speak with you, and it's so nice that you watched the movie. And you, you know, it's so cool to hear you speak about specific parts of the film and it's like oh sweet like some, <laughs> some of the stuff we talked about and tried to make work seemed to work so somebody um, noticed it somebody thankful. noticed it <laughs> yeah somebody noticed the thing and the, the you know that's so cool but yeah it's like 
you know, we, that's why you try to make these things for somebody to, you know, it, not everybody's going to like it or understand it, but um, you hope that someone, you know, takes something away from it. And, you know, it, it doesn't need to change anybody's life, but if it makes you, you know, feel a certain way or you can relate it to your experience, then that's, that's the best. Well, I can't wait to see what you bring us next, Matthew, and I can't wait to talk to you again in the future. Uh, I can't wait either. Uh, yeah, we'll definitely have to do this again. Oh, absolutely. Matthew, thank you so, so much. And again, job well done. Thank you. Thank you. It was so nice to meet you and to talk to you. Thanks, Matthew. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you.